Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Profiling Evil Live. Great to uh, be with you tonight. We're going to jump right in and get rolling here. I, I'm glad to see so many starting to stream in. Uh, there's some good discussion going on out in the web on a couple of other cases, but I'm not seeing a lot in regard to this case, the Ashley Bush murder case. So um, we're going to tackle this and... Uh, see what's going on and try to answer some questions from each of you as we go through this. So I hope everyone's doing well and uh, all the best to all of you. It, uh, it, uh, it's time to get started. So let's jump right in and uh, get going on this thing. And please, I'll be watching the chats, uh, throw in your comments as we go along. This is just a reminder that, that there is evil in the world. People do evil things. And uh, that someone would uh, prey upon a, a pregnant woman, um, you know, at her most vulnerable state is unimaginable. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, that's the world we live in. Well, a pregnant mother is murdered, likely on Halloween. Was this all about a couple's deranged scheme to get a baby of their own? And how did Ashley Bush fall victim to this scam? It's time, folks, for Profiling Evil's Return to the Classroom. Welcome to Profiling Evil and this case review of the Ashley Bush kidnapping and homicide. I want to thank PE member Chuck Tyrell for bringing this case to our attention. Chuck actually lives in the area and he provided some keen insight into the geography there. Now make sure you're hitting that like and subscribe button and let's get into this case a little bit closer. It was Halloween day and a woman who identified herself as Lucy reached out to Ashley Bush with a job offer. Now they'd spoken before this time on Facebook through Messenger, but it seems things were really moving closer to reality. The catch? Lucy said that Ashley needed to accompany her to a job interview with her boss, potentially her new boss, asking Ashley to meet her at their previously uh, arranged interview spot, the Gravette Library. It's about six miles north of their home, and I hope I got that name right. Now, Lucy found Ashley through a Facebook posting for pregnant mothers who wanted to work from home. Ashley, before that, was a cook but she had to quit her job to protect her baby in what appears to have been a pretty high risk pregnancy and still needing to help with household bills. Ashley decided to investigate some of the work opportunities that were available for those who can work from home. It sounded like they were originally supposed to meet around nine o'clock in the morning, but Lucy kept adjusting the times. Now, as I watch this and look at this case, I can see now more about what was going on as they were preparing to do this. These weren't experienced criminals, but these were people with a bent fantasy that they wanted to fulfill. Well, eventually, sometime around 11 o'clock or 12, Ashley's fiance, Joss Willis, and the father of this baby who died, dropped her off at the library. Now, media reports are suggesting that Ashley texted Josh that she was going to meet Lucy and her new boss and that she'd be back soon. Remember now, Ashley has three little children at home who were undoubtedly getting ready for Halloween night and for trick-or-treating. Ashley wasn't moving real quickly, though. This, this woman was 31 weeks pregnant. She had a little girl that was coming, and this little girl, she and Josh, had already named Valkyria. This is significant to me, folks, and I want to focus on this for a moment when we think about behavior. There's a lot of speculation going on that Ashley might have been thinking about giving this child up for adoption, maybe even selling it to other people. I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's likely. To me, there's a marked significance when a parent goes through the tedious process of picking a name out for their child. I mean, think about your own kids. If you have them, how long did it take for you to come up with a name? Now, I also think it's behaviorally significant that Ashley and Josh knew their baby was going to be a girl. That suggests that Ashley was getting regular prenatal care. 
does this sound like somebody who isn't planning on keeping this child and making sure it's a safe delivery? Well, about 3 p.m., Josh reports that Ashley texts him saying the interview's complete and he could pick her up at the Handy Mart. As he waited there, he recognized Ashley in the front passenger seat of a tan pickup truck, driven by the woman he'd come to know as Lucy. The truck was at the intersection near the Handy Mart, and instead of pulling into the convenience store, it took a hard right and sped off to the north on Highway 43. I want to I want to just mention quickly for those of you who are wondering if I've had a like a, a seizure or something. I don't know why I kept saying Handy Mart, and so just except except the fact that I don't live there. I don't know how to do uh, some of these names, but it is gravid I just got. So thanks so much for feeding that information over. Let's now, there carry was this something on. about the look in Ashley's eyes as she stared at Josh while they drove away. He jumped in his vehicle and he tried to follow the truck, but he lost him after a short distance. Let's listen to Josh describe some of the events that day. I uh, honestly wish I w could get more info from them on where they're at if they've even got like an area where she could be, at least something that I would have better understanding on what they were doing. And uh, you know, just how do you feel about the response and what they've done since you notified them that she's missing? Um, actually, I'm very appreciative of how quick they got here, all the stuff that they've gotten to, uh, how quick they've collected their evidence and questioned everybody. I appreciate everything that they've done so far. It's actually surprising that with her missing for only a couple hours, when I first called them, that they jumped on it as fast as they did. Uh, they had officers all night long out looking for her. They, uh, Hey, quit, baby. Uh, they were helping me look for her. They were up here searching all over. Grab it. Uh, around Maysville, they were searching everywhere looking for her on Monday. Uh, the officer that was here that night, he kept talking to me. He kept checking in like every hour to two hours on what he was finding. Uh, Detective Matthews, after I had my meeting with her yesterday, she got a hold of me a couple of times yesterday to let me know what she had found. No, let go. Uh, and then when I found, when I had located Ashley's phone, she got a hold of her officer that was already out here to collect evidence from the handy stop. Uh, he came straight to me and collected the phone, did the measurements, took pictures. Uh, I gave him permission to open her phone found all the messages from her and Lucy. Uh, he told me that they were gonna go back to his, to the office, to their forensic department, to do a deeper search into the phone and to see if they could get any prints or anything off of it to see who all had messed with it. And so are you hopeful that, you know, having her phone, she'll be able to find Lucy's number and hopefully track her down? Um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping they can do that. But the only contact that Ashley and Lucy had together was through Messenger. Um, so I'm hoping they could try to figure out an IMP, IP address off the profile to see if they could actually figure out where the, the profile was actually made to see if they could track it, track her down that way. But other than that, so I want to I want to pause there for a second because there's a couple of things that are important here. I don't know if any of you are interested in uh, cell phone technology. I've spent uh, the last ten years working with uh, law enforcement and first responders all around the world on this specific problem. So I want you to uh, well, I'll just kind of give you a quick overview on it. When uh, law enforcement receives a 911 call from a mobile device, they have to do something that's called a rebid, where they send back a request to the provider, AT&T or Verizon, T-Mobile, whoever it is. In this particular case, 
it's T-Mobile. And when they do this thing called a rebid, what they're doing is they're querying the device itself. So they're they're asking the device electronically to give the GPS reading on the device, which gives it a much better uh, location and makes it much easier for law enforcement to find uh, that device and hopefully the individual tethered to it. Now, the problem in cases like this is that before that rebid happens, most of the time they're the first responders, the dispatch centers are relying on a process called triangulation. And triangulation is a process, just again, think of a triangle. And what it uh, does is it looks at the three closest cell towers. And those can be large towers. They can be small cell sites. Uh, they they um, can be Wi-Fi. But as they look at that, they start to triangulate and create that image that you see. So when you look on your phone to kind of see where you are, you'll see a circle and it'll say somewhere in this area, your phone is located. That can be a huge area, especially in rural areas. And think about when you've been out on the road driving around versus when you're in the city or in your home and you're looking specifically at your phone, which might be then tethered to your Wi-Fi, which is much more accurate. That's the challenge law enforcement's facing. So they may get a cell signal and people say, well, just grab the cell phone signal. But that cell signal could be literally tens of miles uh, of area that need to be searched where it's assuming that that is in there somewhere. So um, that that's kind of the process that he's talking about, that Josh is talking about here, when law enforcement said, hey, can we have permission to go directly to her phone, which bypasses the need to reach out to T-Mobile with what's called an investigative subpoena <clears throat> or a request, a formal legal request for that device location and information. So hopefully that's uh, helpful. I wanted to also add, before we go back into the rest of Josh's comments, that uh, I've been communicating with Josh quite a bit today. And uh, can you imagine what that guy is going through? Number one, he, people were shooting and flinging arrows at him for days, uh, accusing him of being the suspect in this case and being responsible for her disappearance. I see that little child climbing on his lap and and I can't imagine what that family's going to go through. Josh sent me a note. I'm going to post it up. He's going to actually post it on the, I think, the Profiling Evil Facebook page. So facebook.com forward slash Profiling Evil. And uh, he's going to post up a uh, GoFundMe. If you choose to do that, that's completely up to you. I um, Some of those have been successful. I have these uh, horrid nightmares of people like uh, the Morphew family running their GoFundMe and and uh, not giving it to Andy when he needed the money to search for Suzanne. Uh, so you make the decision. But here I think this is clearly a, a legitimate father who's struggling, now has a batch of kids to raise on his own and uh, could probably use a little help. So uh, let me just see if there's some comments here before we uh, go on any further. Uh, Tammy, I agree with you. This is one sad case, and it's just not uh, getting a lot of attention. So I really appreciate all of you uh, jumping on tonight and listening in. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the behaviors, and we're going to get kind of into the classroom a little bit and talk about crime scenes a little bit more. Uh, but uh, let's see here. Uh, Ruth Chidley says, yeah, poor poor man. Uh, let's see here. Um, Jen Lowe, cell phone tech can break a case wide open. Absolutely. But again, that it is uh, not as easy as, as on television and certainly not as fast. It is a difficult science, and and uh, but there have been great uh, pieces of progress made in that. In fact, I'm working with the Czech Republic right now on a process to do that very thing to to uh, combine uh, cell phone location information with social media and have that rise to the level of being able to to report in the same way that a voice report of an accident or something else uh, is is uh, done. So let's see. Michelle says, let's see, she's talking to Alex. So, 
some uh, bad camera work. Southern Sass, good to see you. Have you changed anything about your sign-in name? Oh, you know what? I think you're talking to each other, so I'm going to stay out of your conversations here. And let's jump back into Josh's uh, testimony. Now, listen, you can go to Facebook and uh, look up Josh Willis. You'll see the Arkansas address, and that can take you directly to his uh, site where you can consider that GoFundMe or uh, watch for the Facebook page, and uh, Josh will be posting something up there, uh, I'm sure, later tonight. All they've had is just off a of messenger. And, uh, you know, this Facebook group, do you know any more details about exactly what, have you been able to find this Facebook group yourself? No. You think uh, it's gone now? It's either... She either blocked everybody from it or she deactivated it after what happened on Monday. Uh, I've been through every mom's group that I could think of on Facebook, and I can't find any of Ashley's posts on any of them or this Lucy's post on any of them. I, found, I have found other Lucy's on there, but none of them was the Lucy that I actually had been talking to. And you actually saw this woman yourself, right? Yes. Uh, saw her Friday when Ashley did actually did her interview with her, and then I saw her again on Monday when she picked up Ashley. Did you ever get? I mean, when you were around this lady, I know you said earlier you felt she was disorganized in the interview, but what were your thoughts around how she was acting? Did you get any weird vibes from her? <coughs> um, Friday when we met her, I didn't have any weird vibes on Friday. Uh, she seemed like she was legit. Uh, she asked I don't have an answer for you, Southern anything. Sass. Uh, send me an email. Uh, we told her we needed everything because we haven't bought anything yet. Uh, she told us that she had all the baby stuff that we needed, the car seats, the beds, clothes, all that. That it took her an hour to get home in Bella Vista and an hour back. So I was like, we'll just meet another day and we'll get, get all the stuff from you. She said, okay. Um, that afternoon, Friday afternoon, she messaged Ashley and told Ashley that her boss wanted to meet her at nine o'clock on Monday. I was like, all right, I can take you Monday. I can go donate plasma and you can do your meeting and then we'll, we'll go to the house. Um, around 10, 30, 11 o'clock, Lucy messaged her again and told her that she'd meet her at, meet her at 11 o'clock at Handy Stop to take her to meet the boss. That's when I started getting suspicious about her because one, why would you text somebody that late at night that you're gonna pick them up when she had us meet her and grab it in the first place? Uh, I understand that we were here for Halloween and stuff, so it would, it would have been closer for us to come here instead of all the way back to grab it. But messaging her multiple times that the time was changing, and then when we got here at 11, she messaged us again and told us to be another 30 minutes before she got here. Uh, so around noon is when she finally, it was between 11.35 and 12 before the, uh, they all decided to leave. Uh, when she got out of the car, she was all dressed up, had a nice dress shirt on, it was all multicolor. I don't remember what pants she was wearing. She had a, like a light blue or gray pullover over her dress shirt. There we go. I did it. What what would be alive with me without me uh, talking without the sound on? Uh, so Michelle Morris and a few others have asked uh, to, for a quick overview of what this case is about. This is a mother of three children, pregnant with her fourth. Uh, her the man that we're listening to there is her fiance, and uh, she uh, worked as a cook. We're going to talk a little bit more about it in in the uh, video that I prepared. Uh, but uh, was having a pretty high risk pregnancy, and the doctor said you gotta uh, quit working. So needing to still cover bills and pay their way, she started looking online for work from home jobs. And uh, as luck wouldn't have it, a predator uh, just three days earlier stood up a phony Facebook page calling herself Lucy and uh, indicated that she was looking to help uh, mothers who were expecting. 
and uh, had clothing and car seats and all kinds of things that she could give them plus give them work. In reality, what she was doing was she was trolling uh, and uh, looking for a victim that she could abduct and steal the baby from and and then keep the baby as her own. And that's what's going to unfold in this case. Now, what we did learn in the course of looking at this thing is that uh, this uh, woman traveled from her home to the Gravit Library right here. And at that Gravit Library, uh, she had a interview with this woman who called a few days later and said, hey, good news, the boss wants to meet with you personally. So again, this grooming process. And, and then uh, this predator decided who her victim was going to be. Uh, it had no idea. Uh, I don't understand her choosing a victim that was seven months pregnant rather than nine months pregnant. So clearly not a sophisticated criminal, uh, clearly working off a fantasy and clearly a disorganized individual leaving all kinds of digital footprints. Uh, She agreed to meet her and have this interview that lasted for several hours. And uh, then uh, at that point, Ashley notified her, fiance that uh, he could pick her up at the nearby uh, convenience store. So this is uh, what I believe is the road that they took to the convenience store where he was waiting to pick her up. But instead of picking her up, uh, he happened to look up and noticed that his uh, common bride wife, fiance, Ashley was sitting in the passenger seat of a tan pickup truck that was heading westbound. And as it reached the intersection where the convenience store is located right here, the vehicle sped off to the north. Now he pursued the vehicle because he saw what appeared to be a distraught look in his, uh, and I'm going to just call her his wife, his wife's eyes. They continued up the road to where he lost her. It wouldn't be until later that night that they recovered her phone and, uh, of course, at that point lost track of her. Now, this is where this case kind of gets interesting because they traveled along the border between Arkansas and Oklahoma, and uh, so that's going to bring some federal involvement into it. You can see them clearly going into Oklahoma because this is actually the border So down here is Arkansas. Over here is uh, uh, Oklahoma. And then here is Missouri. So once they were in Missouri, they traveled across through a little town called Jane. I'm going to just zoom out a little bit here so we get this done a little quicker. Jane, and then on to their home here in... um, Pineville. And uh, this is actually the the actual home where uh, this baby, I believe, was taken from the mother and uh, and Ashley was murdered. Now, the thing that's interesting is we're going to learn that the baby was recovered as the as Ashley, who convinced her boyfriend, apparently, that she had a given birth uh, to the baby, um, given birth to the baby who was now in physical distress, and they tried to run the child to the hospital. They were stopped by a deputy. Uh, Then, of course, they got medical help, and uh, the case started unraveling at that point. So, Michelle, everyone else, I hope that helps. And as I was doing that, I missed a couple of very kind donations. So, KK, sorry if you discussed, uh, but aren't they charging them with double homicide? So uh, there, there's no question in my mind that there's going to be homicide charges. I think what's going to happen is she's going to be charged um, with the homicides. We're, we're going to learn more as the days unfold of what his involvement was, whether he was part of this scheme from the get-go or whether she put this wacky plan into play and then he tried to clean up. Somebody shot Ashley 
after that baby was delivered. So um, that's going to be uh, an interesting cog. But thank you so much for that donation. And to Red Rock 59 for that super sticker of 10 bucks. Thank you so much. That All that stuff really helps, folks. So uh, thanks so much for doing that. So let's jump back into this and, and catch a little more of this. Communicating with Josh through uh, email, and uh, he set up a GoFundMe account to help. I'm going to post that information down below, and you can decide whether you want to go and help there or not. This is a grieving man. Now, the woman last seen with Bush was identified later as Amber Waterman. It appears that Waterman tossed Ashley's mobile phone into a creek about a half a mile north of that handy mart as she sped away. When law enforcement got Ashley's cell phone data from Josh, they were able to quickly locate it. Now, based on where she was abducted, the woman was taken north to Highway 90 in Missouri, where they traveled eastbound through Jane, Missouri, and then over to the Waterman home in Pineville, Missouri. Her body would be located near their property, and, and right now, Everything's pointing that that baby was delivered in the home and cared for in the home for a short time before she had some physical uh, difficulties, a medical emergency, and uh, had to be rushed to a medical center. That's what broke this whole thing apart. Now that information, though, wouldn't be uncovered for several days. The baby was recovered on November 2nd when the Watermans reported that the child wasn't breathing as they rushed to a medical center. They led first responders to believe that the child was theirs, and that's where this case started to unwind. It wasn't long, the following day, before Ashley's body was recovered on November 3rd. Now, I don't know if that came from a confession or searching the area, and we're going to learn more about that as this case progresses. Well, folks, this is probably a perfect time to pause and listen to what was released in that police press conference yesterday. There was some really good information that I think will help tie all this together. Let's listen in. Thank you for uh, coming today um, with sad news uh, to report something uh, over my career. This is one of the most horrific um, uh, cases that I have been personally involved with. Uh, this is still an active case. I'll put that uh, out first, uh, that we will be limited to what um, details that we can give because uh, this is a fluid working case at this moment. Um, the Sheriff's Office on October 31st started working a case uh, of a missing person, uh, Ashley Bush. Um, some sad news, they reported that we have found Ashley Bush, um, uh, who was murdered, in our opinion. Uh, we also have found her baby, uh, Valkyrie Grace Willis, uh, who's deceased as well, uh, was found in a separate location. I won't be able to get into details of that. We do have two people in custody. Uh, this has been a joint uh, case that we've been working with the FBI, Big County Sheriff's Office, and uh, McDonald County, <clears throat> Missouri Sheriff's Office. Uh, the two people they have in custody right now are Amber Waterman and Jamie Waterman of Jane, Missouri, who are currently being held on kidnapping first degree charges. Uh, we expect uh, further additional charges to come, and I'll let uh, Nathan Smith uh, speak uh, on where we're going with all that. Uh, well, obviously, we're all, we're uh, our hearts and prayers go out to uh, Ashley's family, and it's a terrible thing. Uh, we have been in touch uh, with uh, multiple jurisdictions. It's clear in this case that there are, there are multiple venues, if you will, that would have jurisdiction for the prosecution of this case. Uh, I've spoken to uh, our U.S. attorney and, and going to have conversations going forward with uh, our federal partners to determine uh, which venue is, is proper to proceed. Uh, the investigation still is ongoing. There are some things that, that we don't know now, and then there are some things that we can't say at the moment since it's ongoing. Uh, but at this point, uh, both of these individuals are in custody. Uh, I believe their federal charges relate to kidnapping uh, that led to murder. Um, and so there will be certainly overlapping charges as this case goes forward. Um, and so that's kind of where that is. So at this point, if, if you guys have questions, we'll be happy to answer them. There we go again. Uh, I want to just pause for a second. I've been uh, communicating back and forth with Josh Willis uh, during the, the live 
right now. And I wanted to just pop up Josh's uh, Facebook page so that you can uh, see uh, where you can go to get that uh, um, GoFundMe information. In fact, here's uh, his note from an hour ago and uh, a link that would uh, take you into that uh, family's page. So um, please, please give that some consideration. Again, make up your own mind, but Josh uh, Willis, in fact, let me just uh, uh, put, I'm going to go back here and uh, put a link to his particular page in the chat box uh, for you all to uh, share. So that'll take you to Josh's page and just let him know that you uh, heard about this on Profiling Evil tonight. Again, can you imagine uh, what this grieving dad is going through right now? I, I just can't imagine the uh, swell that's going on right now. Let's jump back into these questions during the press conference. So at this point, uh, what what we believe is that are they a husband and wife? Yes. Yeah, they're husband and wife. And do we believe that Amy was that woman that you call Lucy? Yes, we, we believe that um, Lucy was a fictitious name, a, an invented persona, and that Amber was uh, the real person. What was the name of the baby again? The baby's name was Valkyrie Grace Willis. Valkyrie Grace Willis? That's right. Can you go into more detail about where they were found? How far from that um, handy shop in Maysville? Um, well, at this point, um, the, the bodies were recovered in the state of Missouri. Um, and so I won't go any, any further than that, but um, they were recovered in Missouri. We have heard rumors that the Watermans were trying to adopt their struggle to have a child. Is that something that you guys? Well, I think that's going to be an ongoing issue. Um, I've certainly, uh, you know, heard things reported on that. And, you know, facts are still. Hey, folks, some thumbs up, please. Thanks, Linda. Uh, so I, I can't say more beyond that. Then they, they did meet online. And please consider that, subscribing to us. Um, that, uh, that they didn't meet that way. And so that's all I know at this point. What time and date were the bodies found? Um, I don't have exact times. Uh, they were. Uh, <clears throat> I'd be, I can't give you that information right now to be exact on it. Um, I believe two separate days they were found, uh, one yesterday and one today, and I can't really get into details on that. The yes. day was actually found today and the baby was found yesterday. Can you tell us the baby were found with the uh, baby was found yesterday and Miss Bush was found uh, today. How close were they to each other? Uh, I, I think I don't think we want to get into that. I think there's that's going to be a, an, an investigative detail that's going to become important later. Um, at this point, um, what I can say for uh, the mother is we we believe at this point investigation leads us to believe that it was a gunshot wound. Yeah. Um, and so I think beyond that, that's you know all we have to say now. There's autopsies that will be conducted and there'll be official reports on that at some point. Uh, but like the prosecutor said, we believe the uh, manner of death. Uh, Certainly, it's probably going to be gun related. Do you think that um, each of these suspects should be charged with two counts of murder? Yeah, well, in Arkansas, if you kill a uh, pregnant woman, then you can be charged with two counts of murder. So, certainly in the state of Arkansas, uh, I would charge them with uh, two counts of homicide. Now, that's all going to have to be worked out jurisdictionally. Uh, what, uh, and it could be, the, the fact could be that multiple different jurisdictions. Uh, can bring charges in this case. So if the facts develop as uh, in a way that justifies bringing charges here in Benton County, we would charge uh, in that fact pattern for two murders because you can in the state of Arkansas do that. Was there any evidence, can you all say, that there was an effort to keep the baby alive? Uh, I, I don't know that. I don't, I don't know those details. So why is Jamie being charged? I know Amber is the one that sure. Beyonce has talked about. Why is Jamie being charged? Uh, well, at this point, uh, law enforcement have reason to believe that both of them were involved uh, in this crime. Uh, and obviously, as the facts play out and the investigation continues, uh, we'll know the extent uh, of that involvement for both of them. Uh, but evidence is at this point that there was reason to hold both of them for, for charges. When will they be in court? Um, I'm not sure in, the, in federal court in Missouri when, when they will appear, um, but I'm sure that will be relatively soon. They'll have to make a bond decision soon. Yes. Do you know if they died in Arkansas or Missouri? 
we're, we're still determining that. I think the investigation will, will uh, lead us there. That's obviously going to be a very important detail in how the case gets charged. At this point, we know uh, that the bodies were found in the state of Missouri. Uh, the investigation will help us know exactly uh, where the deaths occurred. When do you get the jurisdiction or issue? When do you expect that to be worked out? Well, I know that in, in conversations I've had today, I expect to have phone calls uh, and, and visit with uh, federal prosecutors in both Arkansas and Missouri in the next several days. And so that may not be a decision we make in you know a week, uh, but we're certainly going to begin working on it immediately to determine which is the best venue to go for it first. Do you know if they ever made it to Bentonville? Because the whole thing was a job interview in Bentonville. Did they actually ever make it there? Uh, I don't know that. Are there any other people of interest in this case? Uh, no, we believe that we have everyone uh, in custody involved with this, that there's no danger to the public at this uh, uh, time and point. Um, uh, on your other question, we don't believe she went to Bentonville, but uh, it's, like I said before, it's an ongoing investigation. There's a lot of things we have to follow up uh, between here and Welcome Missouri. Welcome aboard, Lacey. So it will be a working case for a little while, and there's lots of things we need to get answered first. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, what I know now, based on the information that we we know now, I think that is accurate. That it was a meeting online, and that it was a job interview that that actually believed uh, that that she was going to. I, I can confirm that's what the evidence tells us now. Now, what's important to remember is that this is still early, right? We have an obligation to tell the public what we know at this point, so they can know that that you know we have unfortunately found them and and they were murdered. Uh, based on the evidence we know now, but it w it is ongoing, and so facts can change, or our understanding of what the facts are can change based on the investigation. But as I stand here now, I believe that's accurate. That uh, she did believe that she was going to meet someone for help with a job interview. Police arrested Amber Waterman and her husband Jamie Waterman, who were booked into the McDonald County Jail on kidnapping in the first degree. They will undoubtedly face other charges, which will likely include homicide, evidence tampering, and or even desecration of a body. Now, the word on the street is that the FBI is likely going to move them to a correctional facility in Springfield, Missouri, some 70 miles to the northeast. What's clear to me, though, is that the evidence we're learning thus far points to the fact that the Watermans wanted a baby and decided to commit these crimes to accomplish this fantasy that they had. They never would have gotten away with it, frankly. They, they were leaving a digital footprint, and I'm sure there would be a whole bunch of explaining to do if they suddenly showed up with this new child in their household. Now, I'd hope that family members, friends, and neighbors would have called foul play on this if they'd actually gotten away with this crime. You know, I want to pause here for a sec because I think Michelle brings up an interesting question uh, that I appreciate, especially knowing her legal background. Um, I I often have mixed feelings when the feds get involved. Sometimes the um, aggravating factors of a case make it really a perfect case for the feds to go after, especially if it involves things where you can add on civil rights violations or hate crime legislation. But I'll tell you what, um, Missouri has really strong uh, child infanticide or homicide charges of children, and uh, they have really strong language concerning the unborn child. And uh, they even go as far in, in Missouri legislation to actually call out that uh, upon conception, that child is protected and murder charges would be filed, not only for the mother, but for the child. Um, so uh, you got a couple of states right there that have death penalties. And uh, this one, this one's going to be really interesting. And it'll, I'm going to be kind of interesting in what all your thoughts are there. But let's let's jump back into this. But keep in mind that this case started with a kidnapping in Arkansas. And it ended in Missouri. That's why the FBI is involved. And it's going to be interesting to see if there are both state and federal charges in this investigation. It's way too early in the investigation. But here's what I found on the suspects in this case. Amber, she's a registered medical assistant. And it appears 
that she's got an education from Franklin Technical College and Crowder College in nursing and medical assistance. She's worked as a CNA before, certified nursing assistant, and as an in-home aide, and as an office manager at Waterman Roofing and Remodel. Now, I find all this interesting and somewhat macabre as I consider how this baby had to have been removed from Ashley. I suspect this woman did it herself. Now, we know that they were physically separated, mom and baby, because police reported that their bodies were in separate locations. It's all becoming pretty clear now. The evidence is that she forced uh, Ashley to deliver Valkyria, and they that child would have been two months premature at the time. Now, experts suggest that babies delivered this far in advance have a good chance of survival in a preterm facility, but not in the Waterman home. It didn't meet the standards of baby care that that child needed. And it was clear that that uh, child suffered medically and then uh, they had to rush to a medical center. Maybe it was that little piece of humanity they showed trying to get that baby to the hospital that brought this case to a conclusion more quickly. I, I don't know if the Watermans have any other children, but the investigation is going to show the effort they put forth to put this case together. Welcome, and to, Linda. Uh, pull this off. Now, if you know if they have children, let let us know. It'd be interesting to know that. Uh, but I suspect that this desire for a child is going to weigh heavily into what motivated them to commit this crime. Now, the only job I could find for Jamie hey, thanks Waterman a lot, JoJo was in roofing, particularly Waterman Roofing. I don't company. know the answer. It's going to be interesting to learn whether Amber met Jamie after going to work for him or if she worked uh, as the office manager just to support her husband. Hey, everybody, it's Mike from Profiling Evil. I've been studying criminal behavior for more than 40 years, and one of my favorite research tools is Truthfinder. It's online, and you're not going to believe the information stored there. So if you want to know more about that new neighbor, your babysitter, or your next online date, give Truthfinder a try. I'm including a link below with special discount pricing. you got to click the link to get it, and then enter EVIL10 at checkout. We're an affiliate, which means we get a small commission, enough to buy a small diet Dr. Pepper, but you could cancel at any time. Thanks for listening today. Well, folks, we're talking about the murder investigation of Ashley and Valkyrie Bush of Bentonville, Arkansas. Two suspects, Amber and Jamie Waterman, are now sitting in jail for the murders. And while investigators haven't laid out a precise timeline of the kidnappings and killings, I believe we can begin to theorize on the timeline and the key locations in this case. You know, I leaned on my friends over at Black Sky today to get some current satellite image of the Waterman home today in hopes of kind of getting a better idea of where Ashley was recovered. I want to stop there for a moment because I've used Black Sky a lot on cases and what Black Sky is, is a array of satellites that are constantly photographing the Earth. And uh, in my day job, I have come to know these guys and used them on Intel cases and other kinds of things. When I got the imagery back, I realized I just couldn't share it with anybody because it uh, is important to the case. So I apologize because I had great plans of at least just showing a little area roped off with tape and having some officers around but uh um, there was a little more being done so uh, if you want to see what that black sky stuff looks like go over and look at my dylan rounds video when i went out and drove around in the west desert and uh, looked for dylan and there i pulled in some of the satellite imagery to use while i was uh, searching around amazingly uh, uh, uh it's amazing to have uh, access to technology like that that costs uh, millions and millions of dollars. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second because uh, a dusty old police officer jumped on to say hi, and I'm going to give him uh, just a couple of minutes to say hello to everybody. Hey, Ron, how you doing? Good, good, Mike. Thank you so much for inviting. I didn't see it until it was kind of late. Um, I wrapped up kind of late tonight, but what a what a case this is. Oof. Yeah, 
th- this one is a tough one, isn't it? It's a uh, it's a tough one emotionally, not not from an investigative standpoint because it's it started to roll together pretty quickly, and frankly, there was such a huge digital footprint that it didn't seem like it would take long to tie the pieces up. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I really don't know much about the case other than what I listened to a little bit here tonight. Uh, but from listening to that press conference, these investigators have their hands full. Quite a few different locations for crime scenes uh, spanning through multiple states. So, you know, uh, forensics, uh, everything that is involved in their digital footprint and so forth is going to be come come into play here to put these pieces of the puzzle together. Well, hey, and you you had, um, uh, we, I'm going to let you listen to the rest of the show. I hope you'll stick around. I know it's late and kind of hard for an old guy like you, but uh, stay up as long as you can. But uh, you, you did a great job today. It's so good to see that murder conviction coming through. I just kept wondering, I, I just hope this uh, Suffolk County DA will step up now and go after Dennis Westenhoff's uh, killer. Uh, he he deserves somebody to to, to look after him. Absolutely, Mike. That's great that you brought that up. But uh, pressure needs to be put on to these folks, and and uh, they need to you know follow through with their um, statements that they made in the past. Yeah. Hey, and I'm just going to say this uh, up front. I'm going to commit commit you to it. Um, you and I have both uh, talked about uh, Lisk, the Long Island serial killer. I did an A and E special. Uh, on that uh, series of homicides, yeah. and uh, I promised the Westenhoff family I'm going to come out and and uh, spend some time with them and spend some time at Dennis's grave. And folks, if you don't know who Dennis Westenhoff is, this is a police detective who was murdered the day after he took his little girl to the uh, Valentine's dance 31 years ago. And uh, uh, cops just never quit thinking about cops who die in the line of duty. And, uh, and so, uh, anyway, I'm going to come spend some time with the family, Ron, I, I, uh, already lined up, uh, Ray, Captain Ray Kelly to, to, uh, bring a drone out and you and I are going to go back out and we're going to walk Lisk from, uh, one end of Long Island to the other and go Gilgo beach. Maybe, maybe even put some Bermuda shorts on who knows. Uh, I'm that's, I'm, I'm ready to do it, Mike. I'm up to the task. <laughs> Well, good. Well, I think I think we'll either do it right before it starts getting terribly cold, which is we got snow here in Utah today. So, uh, or uh, uh, we're going to do it in the springtime. Let's shoot for April. Sounds good. It's <laughs> there you go. Too, so you can maybe buy me a couple of cold ones. Uh, I, I I'll buy you a big old whatever Dr. you Pepper. drink, and you'll have to put up with my diet, Doctor Pepper. I'll have a diet, Doctor Pepper, with you. We'll cheers to that, Mike. All right. Take care of yourself, brother. Love seeing you. Thank Thank you you so much for bombing in. And thank you. Thanks for Hey, everybody. Make sure you're subscribing to Duty Ron and make sure you're going over and listening to his stuff. And Ron, thanks for always uh, uh, pointing people our way too. My pleasure. My 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 pleasure. Thanks, Mike. See you later. Bye now. What a great guy. Thanks, Ron. Um, Hey, uh, (laughs) you know, we kind of have this standing thing where we just, we'll bomb in on each other once in a while. And, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Annie Elise is taking care of kids and I often bring her in and other, uh, YouTubers, but anyway, let's get back to this thing. I'm just getting too far off course. In addition, I wanted to scratch out this information on crime scenes in this case, and I'd encourage you to go over to our Academy playlist and learn more about the differences. In this case, I believe that there are multiple crime scenes, and I'm theorizing all this based on what's been reported by police and the mainstream media. First, let's talk about the initial contact site. Now, this can be a little bit tricky. The question becomes, is the online presence on Facebook or the Gravette Library the initial contact site? In reality, it's both. You see, when Amber Waterman posing as Lucy, connected with Ashley regarding work and help for a pregnant now stay-at-home mom, she was conspiring and grooming this woman. This included promises of work, and if the reports are accurate, promises of help with the pregnancy, the birth, baby clothes, car seats, all of that stuff. Now, while the online interactions were clearly the initial contact site, there was a secondary initial contact site, that library, This is the place where both the suspect and the future victim come into contact with each other. Thus, both locations could be considered the initial contact site. 
Although the purist in me says the Facebook and Messenger interactions were truly the first initial contact site. Second, the crime scene. Again, there are going to be multiple crime scenes in this case. The first might actually be that handy mart or the intersection outside of that handy mart. Remember, this is the location where Josh was waiting to pick up his fiance, Ashley, after that job interview. It was here that the crime of kidnapping likely occurred, if not just even moments earlier, as Amber, also known as Lucy, drove from the Gravette Library to the Handy Mart where she was supposed to meet Josh. Somewhere along that line, she gained control, whether it was with a weapon or some other way, but right in that area, that would have been the first crime scene location of the kidnapping. Now, the second crime scene location could be that area where Ashley's phone was thrown from the vehicle. And all the reports suggest that was about a half a mile to the north of the Handy Mart. Now, as the kidnapped woman was taken into Oklahoma, because it's right on the border, and then back over to Missouri, there probably are going to be federal laws and additional crime scenes there. And of course, the most important crime scene, in my opinion, is the location where that forced delivery of the child occurred and the location where Ashley was murdered. Each is an important crime scene, and it seems to me more probable that the delivery was inside the Waterman home and Ashley was either murdered there or at a location where she was recovered, the disposal site, which leads us to the disposal site. Now, it appears that Valkyrie was discovered at the home, or at least en route to the medical center. We don't know the exact location. It hasn't been released yet. In addition, we don't know the exact location where Ashley was recovered, but we have heard through mainstream media that it was near the Waterman home. These are both disposal sites, and forensics examinations are going to tell us an awful lot. Now, police have indicated that Ashley died from a gunshot wound, and it appears that the baby survived birth for a short time, then became critical and was rushed to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. The autopsies are going to be critical in determining the reasons each person died. Now, 5 News offered up this update this morning. Let's watch this. Breaking now, we have new details into what investigators believe happened when pregnant Ashley Bush was taken from Benton County. As we have reported, she and her baby were both found dead, but in different locations in Missouri. We want to warn you, some of these details, they may be hard to hear. 5 News reporter Catherine Gilker has been on top of this story since the beginning. She's in the newsroom with more on what we're learning. According to the probable cause affidavit we received this morning, Amber Waterman admitted details of the kidnapping and murder to her husband. Attorneys believe Amber Waterman wanted to keep the baby for her own. Amber Waterman has officially been charged with kidnapping resulting in death and her husband Jamie Waterman with accessory after the fact to kidnapping resulting in death. Prosecutors say these actions resulted in Bush's death. Let's break down what the report shows. After detectives learned about the pot possible abduction on Monday. They got details from the victim's fiance about the possible work from home job interview with a woman named Lucy. Investigators found a Facebook account for Lucy and on that account, a public post about baby items available for moms in need. Detectives believe this is how the two first connected. Ashley's fiance found her phone in a ditch and turned it over to detectives. They then were able to find the information on Lucy, trying tying that page to Amber Waterman. Using an emergency request to Facebook and T-Mobile, they were able to identify an IP address for Amber's location. Then using Google Maps data, they confirmed Ashley did travel to Maysville and her home in Pineville, Missouri on Monday, which was a day of the abduction. The next day on Tuesday, detectives went to the home of the Watermans and they allowed them to search their property. Their detectives noticed a truck matching the description of the one that Amber was last seen in while at the home. Waterman told detectives she never left the house Monday until she allegedly went into labor, calling 911 and meeting an ambulance at a convenience store near their home. When at, at home, they asked to see her phone and she stated she lost it. They asked if she knew Bush and she said no, but her husband's story is different. In a separate interview with her husband, 
Jamie. He says he came home for lunch and Ashley was not home and the truck was gone. He says he didn't hear from his wife until later that afternoon, saying she was having a miscarriage. He says he then left work and went with them to the emergency care. Now, yesterday, a search warrant was served at the Waterman's home. At the same time of the search warrant, detectives also interviewed the husband, Jamie, at his work. He said on Monday he found blood inside their truck and he assumed it came from his wife during her miscarriage. Jamie told detectives his wife cleaned the blood from the truck and burned the rags afterwards. He told them once detectives left his home on Tuesday, his wife told him she had killed Ashley and then changed her story saying Lucy killed her. But not long later, she led her husband to Bush's body laying next to the house rolled in a tarp. They then moved her body to a burn pile, poured on gasoline and burned her. Then the couple transported her body and Jamie's truck to an area off the property. Detectives asked Jamie if he could show them where the body was disposed and he took them to an area not far from their home. What the report did not tell us is when and how Ashley gave birth to the infant before she was killed. The range of punishment for Amber Waterman if found guilty is a death penalty or life in prison. As for Jamie Waterman, he faces up to 15 years in prison and a hefty fine. We're so what are your thoughts, folks? Where would you put the different crime scenes and what do you think the motive was and the timeline of events are? I'm going to be watching for your comments down below, so please take a moment and enter them in and respond to each other. Hey, and while you're at it, consider joining our channel memberships, particularly the Academy level. It's a place where you get a little more info and usually you get it ahead of everyone else. Well, folks, um, I'm, I'm really interested in reading what you have to say in regard to this one. Again, I want you to think about these crime scenes in three buckets, the initial contact site, the actual crime scene where the, the crime occurs. That's, that's that, uh, thing that someone can be charged with murder, kidnapping, desecration of a body. Those are, are things that are typically tied to the crime scene. And then number three, the disposal site, because each of them will teach us something behaviorally about the offender that's involved in this. And it will teach us a little more about the victimology. And we're starting to really see this one come to the surface and really start to understand the motivation here. Um, what, what I think we're going to see at the end of the day is that, uh, that Amber Waterman, convinced her husband over time that she was pregnant. Might have been because of her weight, uh, may have been a number of reasons, but then she went looking for a baby to satisfy whatever that fantasy was or that story she was pitching was. Uh, maybe that's why she had to take a woman who was seven months pregnant rather than a full-term person, uh, which would certainly show a lot differently on her body and of course, on the victim Ashley's body. Then uh, she put together this uh, scheme to say, listen, I've, I've had this uh, baby too soon. Let's run to the hospital. And that legitimizes things. But if all that's true and the husband didn't know, we know now from that reporting, if it's accurate, that he stepped in and he helped her clean up the mess. She took care of cleaning up the mess in the vehicle but he took care of cleaning up uh, and, and taking care of uh, disposing of Ashley. What a horrible thing. And frankly, I hope Josh and his family aren't watching this as we discuss it. So um, I, hope, uh, I hope you'll follow Don Marie's counsel here and hit the like button, folks. If you're not a member, please subscribe and join us. And, uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's just keep this family in our thoughts and prayers and, uh, and, and most importantly, learn from these kinds of cases. I want, I want you to also put some comments down below as you think back on presentations I've given on the victim risk continuum and what Ashley could have done that would have minimized her risk in the process of this. Number one, getting in a vehicle to go to a job interview somewhere else. Um, but uh, like in many cases, we, we saw this in many, many cases where someone appeals to some type of need and the person lets down their guard. Uh, I think one of these next times we'll talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the responsibility we have to try to understand on that hierarchy of needs 
where an individual is as a victim, because it's a lot easier once we understand where they are on that hierarchy to understand why they could have been tricked into something like this. So thanks so much for supporting us. And let's finish up with this. Hey, make sure you've hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell so you get all of our notifications. And do not forget to check us out on Profiling Evil at your favorite podcast platform. And since Christmas is approaching, don't forget about Profiling Evil merchandise and my books. You can find ordering information in the description down below. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene.